All right, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. We are excited that you're here with us for our final installment of the Niche Careers in Social Work. We have had a great time with all of these different areas. And if you've missed any of the other sessions that we've had, feel free to check them out on our Social Work YouTube channel. You can find those um, right there posted. Not everyone was recorded, but we do have a bulk of them that we offered are all recorded and posted up there. So today we're gonna to be talking about political social work. So I want to introduce my colleague, my friend, Professor Marla Blunt Carter, who has a bachelor's in political science with a specialization in public administration from the University of Delaware. She has a MSW from Rutgers University. And at the time the specialization was called administration policy and planning. She is an associate professor of professional practice here for eight years at Rutgers. And she has actually been working on political campaigns since the age of nine. So there's a whole bunch of experience that you're gonna to get to hear about and, and get to really um, just indulge in and to hear about her experiences and her practice. So I'll get us started just briefly, uh, Marla. Can you just give us a, just a, I mean, like a snapshot of some of the campaigns that you've worked on and what has been your role on some of those campaigns? Yeah, so first of all, I'm just grateful to be here. Thank you, Dr. Bembry, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity uh, to speak about political social work because I believe that it is a growing uh, specialization in our profession. And I am just honored uh, to be able to speak about something that I love so much, both politics and social work, right? Um, and so campaigns I've worked on um, started out with, with my father, uh, who also is an MSW graduate from Rutgers School of Social Work. Uh, he's 50 years a social worker, and I learned political social work from him. Uh, it didn't exist, the name political social work, uh, at the time that he was in the program. It was just a part of uh, the profession. And so he was my model, the image uh, that I wanted to emulate. And I watched him. And so he was the first campaign. And that was in 1984. Um, and that led me to major in political science. All the while, I really wanted to, to, to help people. And I saw that politics was the vehicle that my dad was using. And it was an effective vehicle. So I wanted to do that. Uh, majored in political science. People thought that that the road was going to be law school. It in fact turned out to be Rutgers. Um, and I'm glad that it was. After my dad's campaign, um, I've worked on a lot of state and local races. I don't too many to name. I am in the state of Delaware, the home state of our 46th president, uh, President Joseph R. Biden Jr. And I worked on his campaign. Um, senatorial campaign. I also worked on his, his late son's campaign, Bo Biden, as he ran for attorney general. Um, since then, I've worked on the campaign for insurance commissioner, um, who was a strong democratic woman that was uh, facing obstacles against her own, I mean, from her own party. And I wanted to see that woman reelected and treated fairly. And she won. Um, and then I worked on uh, the Obama campaign. 2008, I was one of 50 state directors uh, to run an Obama-Biden headquarters in the state of Delaware. Um, following that one, what did I do after that? Done so many. Uh, in the process of, of, of doing the big races, I also have advise on smaller races, school board races, city council races, uh, state rep races. I am more involved in local politics, but the national politics is, is where people really uh, respect the work more. Although our work on the local level is probably the most impactful. Um, the most recent campaign that I've worked on has been my sister. Lisa Blunt Rochester, who is Delaware's lone Congresswoman. I, um, well, uh, 
it's because of me and my very loquacious personality that she became a candidate before she knew she was going to be a candidate. Um, and it has been a joy to watch her as the first black woman, uh, as the first person of color and the first woman ever to represent the state of Delaware. So I enjoy making history when I work for candidates. Uh, president Obama, first black president. Lisa Blunt Rochester, first black female in office. Joe Biden, the first Delawarean to be president. I like making history um, and it's fun, but it's also important. And social workers need to be in this game with me. So that's why I'm here and that's what I do. Awesome. I mean, there's so many campaigns and so much experience that you have working there and, and just like thinking about all these campaigns you just named. And I know there's some that you didn't name, but out of all of these, like what are some of your most notable memories or those ones that you hold clear, uh, dear to you on those campaigns? You know, I, I, I thought I was gonna start with something like the Affordable Care Act, but what's happening today and in the world right now is the violence and the treatment against trans people. And that um, what I'm most proud of and what I am really committed to at this point is getting more trans representation in office. Um, in Delaware, State Senator Sarah McBride is the highest ranking trans elected person in the country. I have known her since she, she was 18. I advise her, I support her, and I will work even more intentionally in, in identifying um, trans people that have an interest in serving in office and finding ways to support them because I think we need uh, diverse voices at the table. So that's one of the, the highlights was helping to get her elected. Once again, making history. Um, the second one, like I said, was when I, when I ran, I mean, helped the insurance commissioner to run for reelection. It was in 2012. Um, and so let's back up 11 years ago. And that was at the time that the Affordable Care Act was being challenged. Um, it was upheld six months after I started working in the insurance commissioner's office, which meant that we had to build an insurance marketplace for individuals that were uninsured or underinsured um, to, to, to finally be covered and to play a part in one of our, our nation's history's most impactful, um, you know, policy changes that would affect millions of people. That was a highlight for me that I, I through uh, communication and outreach that I was able to make sure that black and brown communities were insured, that, that those living below the poverty line were insured. Um, and that, that was a highlight. Um, another highlight, like I said before, was the Obama campaign, of course. Um, and then lastly, in 2020, 2020, yes, I was asked to be one of three electors in the Electoral College. Delaware has three people that are selected to be an elector. I was one of them. And to, to be able to represent the voters of Delaware in that process, although the electoral uh, college is, is some think it's antiquated um, and, and unfair and that we should, we should um, count votes in a different way, until that changes, um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to play a, a role in that process. And here's why, not just because I was afforded the opportunity to do so, but because at the time that I did this, I was still recovering from a stroke. I was still learning how to write, to hold a pen. And for four months, I practiced my signature. My sister bought me an iPad with an eye pen so that I could practice it every day because I wanted my signature to be legible enough so that people knew that this woman, this black woman, this 
uh, challenged, physically challenged in the moment, black woman social worker was an elector. So we're going down in history as one of those electors was a social worker. And so that was another proud moment for me. Well, these are exciting. And, and I just want to put a plug out here for Sarah McBride. If y'all have never heard her speak before, you are missing a treat. And if you are attending the NASW conference in New Jersey next weekend, you would have an opportunity to hear from her. But she is an amazing speaker. I have a little notepad that I have of Sarah-ism. She always has these great little nifty statements that, that little catchy, sticky statements that yes. you hold on to. So she's an yes. amazing speaker if you haven't had a chance to hear from her. Dr. Brimbury, do you remember the 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 time that we brought Sarah McBride to yes. the Canada campus? Yes. And she yes. spoke um, at one of our um, symposiums. And mm -hmm. one of the lines that she said, and this was right around the time that uh, Joe Biden was running for office. And she said, I said, how do you find it hard to um, accept him as a candidate now? knowing the history of, uh, of, of some of his legislation and, and how it has impacted individuals. Do you see him as being someone different now than who he was then? And she said, I believe that it is important that we extend grace as long as the individual continues yeah. to demonstrate growth. Yeah. What? Yeah. That sound like a social worker. And Sarah's not a social worker, but she's someone who identifies as one. So mm -hmm. that to me is everything that she extends grace as long as people yeah. continue to demonstrate growth. That's something that we as a profession say that we do, but I don't know if we walk that every day. Right. Right. No, this is good. I mean, and it, this is a good, I think, a good segue for. Um, thinking about this because as you mentioned that she does identify as someone who you know identifies as a social worker although that's not her field but when you think about this we have politics and then we have political social workers mm -hmm. so how do we how do we decipher the difference between the two in that arena right so every social worker should be engaged in some form of political practice because we all have an ethical mandate it's in our code of ethics Actually, it's standard 6.04, but you know, I don't, I don't want to be too specific, but it says that we are responsible for engaging in political and social action. So that's every social worker. So a political social worker is somebody that, um, you know, is a social worker, right, who effectively navigates power dynamics and strategies in order to bring about social justice and social change. So it's a social worker, but they have uh, institutional knowledge. They know best practices about how to navigate these systems. What does power look like? How do I deal with power uh, within power you know, uh, that people want to have? It's understanding power, right? And, and, and how that plays into policy. Um, and so that, that's what political social work is. It is, it's, it's social work, but it's social work with some knowledge about these systems. And, and it's not knowledge that is hard to gain. This is easy as a Google search. Who represents who? How do they vote? Right? How many votes does it take to get into office? It's, it's stuff like that. But there are five different domains to political social work. So I think we think political social work means run for office. Nope, that's only one of the five domains. So Natalie, do you want me to go into the five domains or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a good, a good space for it because you're kind of hitting on some of these, these points about the importance of social workers being involved. But I think hitting the domains might give um, a better sense of to, as to why social workers should be involved. Okay, so the first one is about civic participation and civic education. It's really, um, it's, it's engaging individuals and communities in the political process. It's, it's, it's presenting political empowerment because I said this whole thing, this whole game is about power, right? So it is helping people to, um, to know what this process is all about. It is almost like, 
I try to do with political social work with my students, it is demystifying politics. It's helping people not to be afraid of being in this space because all of us are touched by policy every single day. And so in the domain, domain number one, uh, which is engaging individuals and communities in the process, um, you know, that's stuff like performing outreach to increase voter turnout, um, educating underrepresented, upper represented, underrepresented groups. Now, in that, that part about educating underrepresented groups, that's a big part of what I did when I was working in the Department of Insurance. I was speaking to communities that were not informed as to uh, their rights when it comes to health, right, and health insurance. So that just that act was me doing um, engaging communities, right? Because engaging communities doesn't mean getting communities to turn out to vote, engaging them in the political process. The second domain is influencing policy agendas and decision-making. That's when we lobby and that's when we, um, you know, we, we try to influence policy agendas uh, of certain candidates. We try, you know, our, our intention is to um, make sure that we are part of the policy making process at the beginning, right? Social work historically is involved in the policy making process at the end. We're trying to fix what they messed up instead of building good systems. We're trying to dismantle stuff. And then all of a sudden we're like, why is this so hard? It'd be a lot easier if we were in the beginning. Uh, domain number three is holding positions in uh, political spaces. I was the director of constituent services for uh, then Senator Joe Biden and his projects manager for health, education, and housing. So that meant that I was responsible. That was my portfolio uh, when it pertains to issues of health, education, and housing. When nonprofits in those particular sectors uh, were applying for federal grants, I helped to write the letter of support. When um, there was an issue that was related to education that the senator needed to know that they wanted to see some type of legislate legislative solution. I wrote up the memos and the briefs so that he knew what was happening in those streets, right? So I, I was like the, the, the connector um, as the projects manager. But you can have so much influence when you were on staff of elected officials, right? And not only elected officials, when you are working in governmental systems agencies, um, working for Department of Treasury or Department of Commerce, because you're also influencing culture just by your mere presence and your values as a social worker, being a part of these uh, staffs, they start to learn how we think, dignity and worth of a person. That should be the way that our, our governmental systems operate with that paramount. Um, the fourth one is actually working um, on campaigns, right? working on campaigns, running campaigns, um, educating voters about the policy issues as it pertains to certain candidates, you know, helping them to, to make a, a more um, educated decision as to who they want to represent them. And then the last one, of course, is running for office yourself, being the candidate, right? Um, I have uh, so many links that I wanna share with you guys. One of them is the campaign school. And that is when you, you go and you get trained as a social worker, how to run for office. I am in the process right now of um, Rutgers will be hosting a campaign school next year. And we will be doing it at Rutgers Camden uh, with Temple, Westchester, Widener, Bryn Mawr, all of the schools in the Philadelphia area. We've never had the campaign school here before. And um, I'm one of the conveners uh, to make sure that we get more social workers educated and informed as to how to run for office. So those are the five domains. And that's, those are the strategies of a political social worker. So that's what differentiates us. It's an ethical mandate for every social worker to be involved in and know about policy and politics. But a political social worker has uh, skill sets 
and institutional knowledge about best practices as it as as it pertains to navigating uh, political spaces and 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 addressing the power dynamic. That was a lot. I got I got dressed. That, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was good though. That was good because you know it's we always ask the question like well what what do we what can we do how do we do it how do we get involved like we always ask these types of questions and I think one of the things that usually happens is you know we all say get out and vote get out and vote get out and vote but then we don't we don't do anything after the vote mm -hmm. if I could say that like we just kind of like I voted so mm -hmm. now let's just hope they do what they say they're going to do but I, I mean I can imagine with all these processes these strategies you just talked about there have to be some challenges in in this process and and there's also some some beautiful opportunities that come out of this but can you speak to what some challenges and opportunities in social work um, in political social work yeah i think the challenges um uh, in political social work are, are 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 the same in the political about politics but also about social work okay i think that people are um ill-informed about how to make change happen, how to get involved. They feel as though this is something that is, they don't have the skill set to do, right? That this is, is too big for them. And, and you know, they, they're Harvard educated lawyers and I don't even know what I'm talking about. I, I, I could not possibly run and I don't want to get out there and, you know, and, this is a time of, of toxicity when it comes to politics. People don't talk politics, religion, and I forgot the other one. But <laughs> now is the time that you must talk. So I think one of the challenges is that people, uh, we have to deal with the, the partisan politics and the negativity um, in a way that we don't dismiss or disrespect others but that we are still true to our own values. So when we say the dignity and worth of a person, that means the person that is the other party, whatever party you are, even the one that's talking something that you think is, is totally like, doesn't make sense to you. You still have to demonstrate respect and you still have to learn how to lean in. So I think that's one of the challenges is that we know that, that right now uh, our country is at a pivotal point when it comes to policy changes and uh, people are on edge. Um, and so people are afraid. It's hard. It's hard to talk politics, right? That's, that's number one. But it's also people have misperceptions of what it really looks like to work in these spaces. They're just making these assumptions based on the, the individuals that we see in the news or um or the movies that we watch or you know just the images that are portrayed but when you're really in these spaces i'm telling you it is the same you have office politics when you're working at a nonprofit you have competing interests when you're working in community you, but you're using the same social work skills it's about strategic partnerships right it's about effective communication. It's about it's the same thing. So I think you know the 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 misperception of both our profession, who we are as social workers, because when we show up on the screen, they're like, "Well, why is a social worker here in this political space?" So that's a challenge that we have to help them to understand our strengths, right? And I love being the, the social worker, the only social worker in the room with an MSW, and they all have JDs and MBAs and then the moment the social worker says something profound and very useful, because we always do, I'm telling you, it is like a silence that is golden. But it means that you have something that none of them have to offer. That's what makes you valuable. So that challenge of, them, uh, of us having to reframe uh, the perception of what social work is, is also our strength. It is also um, the beauty. So I think, I think that's the biggest challenge is, is misperception, misperception of what politics is and misperception of who we are as social workers. 
No, that's huge. Because often people, when you talk to folks and then you tell them you're you're going to school for a degree in social work, they're like, why do you want to take people's kids? Right? That's like the first thing people all, that's all they think about is like, that's, you just going to do that. And that's not it. There's so many other spaces you can be in, in, in social work. But you, you touched on this piece about relationships. And I want to highlight that because I think it's relationships are extremely important. And, and I don't know about y'all, but if you've, if you had chance to attend a town hall for your, your local state assembly person or state congressional rep, um, just like, or even your, your congressional rep for down in, in DC, like relationships are important. Relationships are so important. And I, I've had the opportunity, I, I befriended a, a state, um, He's a state assembly person down here in South Jersey. And just, we were on a walk. We were doing a a walk together. It was um, during um, Black History Month. We took this, it was an eight mile trek that we walked the tracks of um, Harry Tubman from New Jersey to Philly. Mm -hmm. And so when we walked though, this, 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 this person, so I'm just taking over this one part, but I'll give it back to Marlon in a second. But the, the, the state assemblyman that I had a chance to walk with, right? You know, like he's like six five, y'all. I'm like five three on a good day. Like, but his pace and my pace are the right pace, like for walking. Like I cannot walk slow. And so I caught up with him at like the four mile mark, and we walked together for the next four miles, and we talked about everything. Like he's asking me questions, like as a social worker, like how do you do it? Like how do you do this? And then he's like, what are some pressing issues? Here's an in. What are some pressing issues that y'all have? I took the whole opportunity, like he works a lot with youth. I said, listen, y'all talk about building more jails. Y'all talk about all this programming, but nothing's working because the recidivism rates are high. I was like, why don't we look at doing some proactive work as opposed to trying to figure out something after the fact. He was like, you know what? People haven't been talking about that. It was just an opportunity, mm-hmm. an opportunity. And mm-hmm. so I took that, that chance that I had. And I was like, you know, do you speak of students? And he was like, yeah, I'll do that. And so I invited him, he came last semester and, and we had a like a conversation like this little chat. And then now, like like me and his chief of staff, like she'll send me an email be like, hey, listen, we have a job opening. There's openings in the county. Do you know some people? Like it's all these pieces. And, and then I'll say, you know, I'm coming out to your, like he does every month, a one time a month volunteer um, piece is called Serve with Singleton. And so I go right to the volunteer thing. We went out to the farm and picked vegetables for the for um, the food pantries. I mean, they do so many things. They go and paint the schools, they collect books, but it's that relationship though, when you build that relationship, it's lasting. Even if some stuff you may not necessarily agree with. Like, I mean, there's some things he talked about and I was like, oh, how did that, how did that work out? And he's like, yeah, it was, it didn't go over well. I was like, oh, okay, you'll do something different then. So, I mean, just even in that, building that relationship. And I think that's a great opportunity for us as social workers because they get to actually hear, like we know, what people are going through, mm-hmm. right? And they're just hearing from some people, but we know the social problems that impact people we work with. And so I think it's important for us to bring that forward to them. So they're not just walking around, just making assumptions. Or like, if you go to like their town halls and it has like two people in there and mostly their staff, like they're not hearing from us. And so I think those relationships are opportunities for us. And I think it's a good way, um, and I wanted to ask um, Marla too, is how some ways we can get involved with politics and things like that. So I want to put that out there, but I'm just telling y'all that's, that's how I did it, but I want to get some more stuff from, from Absolutely. Marla. Absolutely, and, and thank you for sharing that. And that it's so funny that, you know, as we talk about the importance of human relationships, which is one of the six core values um, and will probably be on your licensure exam if you haven't sat for the exam yet, but, um, My class last night, my political social work class last night, I had them do a caucus exercise. And and, uh, the six core values were, I I posed the question, which one is the most important? Social justice, integrity, importance of human relationships, um, dignity and worth of a person, competence. Uh, I I don't know which order I said it in, service and social justice. But anyway, they they learned how to caucus. And in the process of learning how to caucus, they also worked on persuasive communication, which is critical in political spaces. You you have to know how to talk. You have to know how to talk fast. You have to know how to get your point across. You have to know um, how to persuade individuals. Um, 
and what one was the importance of human relationships. Now it was it was quite a discussion, but that probably is the one that that is the most beneficial when it comes to political social work. Um, Dr. Moore Bembry talked about uh, volunteering for an elected official, but in doing so. She's building relationships with those that work for the elected official, for the elected official himself, for other community members that are a part of that community that are voters, so that you know it, it becomes um, a reciprocal relationship. It's not transactional. It's not about you give me what I want, right? It's about how can I contribute to your success and how can you contribute to the success of our community, right? Um, and so. Yeah, there are ways that, that we can build those relationships, that we can leverage those relationships. And, you know, when I give my, my, my talk on, um, uh, you know, how to get into the room and how to act, I speak about the four no's. Know your, know your member, know the staff, know the issue, and know your ask. Know the member know the staff, know your issue, know your ask. When I was a staffer and people would come in looking for the Senator to support certain issues, they have 15, 20 minutes. Speaking to the staff is probably more impactful than speaking to the member <laughs> because they're the ones that write the brief. They're the ones that present the recommendations. They're the ones that are connected to the community that can get you the community members that can represent the issue if, if, if so needed to testify. Um, so the staff and the relationship that you need to build with the staff and the reputation that you need to have uh, in order for that relationship to blossom is critical. But you need to have an ask. And ask is not even about money. It's why are you there? <laughs> what do you want them to do, right? You don't want to just rail about what you don't like. What is it that you can bring? Maybe you can be a subject matter expert on a certain issue. Maybe you can uh, offer volunteer hours on the campaign side because the official side and campaign side are two separate things. So as, as we're talking about building relationships, I just wanted to, to just throw, throw out my four no's, which are actually K-N-O-W's, not N-O's. All right. So. Let's do this real quick, and then we can open it up for discussion. I got 10 things for you, and I'm going to put some, some of the links in the chat just because I'm that kind of girl. Let me see if I can find one right here. So the first one is, that ain't it. Hold on. Is voting, you know what? Instead, I'll put them in the chat in a minute. Dr. Moore Bembry, can you share my screen? Can I do that? Can we do that? Let me click on that. You should be able to. Oh, okay. no, here we go. All right. Can you guys there see you that? Go. You can see that? Voting is social work. That organization, as it states, is a national social work voter mobilization campaign. And the reason why I'm sending you or sharing this link with you is because it has actionable ways that you can get involved, right? Um, it has toolkits, research articles, podcasts, documentaries, films, just to keep you motivated and inspired. But it also has ways that you can register voters. In every state, they have different ways that you can register voters. Some places, it's against the law because they're trying to suppress voter, voter registration, but it's against the law for another person to help somebody register to vote. Not in New Jersey, that's not the case here. But I just want you to, you know, look this website over. That's an, that's number one. Number two is something called Gain Power. Let me see if I can find it up here. Um, no, it's not. I'll just go down the line. The Campaign School for Social Workers. This is what I was talking about um, that we're going to try to have located here in uh, Camden, Rutgers Camden. But I attended the one in Connecticut in February and actually was a moderator on a panel and a, and a, one of the presenters as well. Um, so the, the Nancy Humphreys Institute um, led by uh, Tanya Rhodes has been doing the campaign school for over 20 years. The sad part is that not enough of us even know about it. So 
I just wanted to make sure that all of you knew about the campaign school. And they had students from as far as Germany attend this year, over 200 students. Um, and so Rutgers is now gonna play a part in that. Um, I wanted to bring you to When We All Vote. It's another website that um, can help you to not only uh, register people to vote, but to get involved in local school board uh, campaigns all the way up to the president. Now, here we go. Let's say you wanna work on the Hill. This is uh, the, the House of Representatives Employment Bulletin. It lists all the jobs that are currently available. Here's the, the resume bank um, and the different positions with members or on committees, positions, um, with other house organizations. So there are, so there are so many opportunities for us to be in the room. We, may, we don't have to be elected to influence policy, but we do need to be in the room. Okay, here's gain power. Gain power, and I sent students to this last year. I, I, I had a, a connection and we made something happen where they went to the actual uh, uh, summit. But gain power is also where jobs are listed. Um, and this is on the political side. So the house, the, the one link that I'm going to share with you was the house. This is on a campaign, right? Um, let me get this out of the way. I can't see. That is critical. I'll share that. I'll come back to that. And then the last thing is, are you registered to vote, right? Check your registration, check your polling place. It may have changed. You might be registered as an independent and you have a closed primary. So you can't vote for the, you know, the dem in the Democratic race or you might be a Republican, but now you've decided that you wanna be an independent. You need to make sure that your stuff is up to date before you start telling somebody else how to do something, right? And uh, what was I gonna come back to this? Nope, not that, this. I'm gonna share this with you. We spend a lot of time talking about politicians. Oh, they are this way. They are that way. I can't stand all of those crooked politicians. There are half a million people that are elected officials in this country. Half a million. 519,682. Yet we only see the bad actors, the ones that are not in alignment with our values, maybe, or are not operating in the way that they should. But there are so many that are serving well. It's called public service. So what I hope that you will do and you will gain from this, you'll walk away um, realizing that we talk about not generalizing when it comes to certain populations or certain issues, but so many of us do it every day when it comes to politicians, elected officials. So let's stop doing that understanding that some may be good and a few might be bad, but we have to get involved nonetheless. But this is how it breaks down. So we spend a lot of time focusing on the federal elections, the White House, Congress, Senate. 96% of those elected are local. Those seats are important and you can win a local race with just your family, friends, and members of your organizations, and your community. It's not that hard to go run and win in a local election. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm, I wanted to share those with you um, and, and just really, um, let me bring this up, and, and really just help you to understand that it is so much more than what we think when we talk politics. Um, yeah, let me get out of there. It is, it is working in politics. It is supporting those that are running for office. It is educating communities so that they are politically empowered, politically empowered, right? Um, so the website, Gain Power for Campaign Work. Hill Opportunities, got the Hill Bulletin. Party Activities, you need to know your state and local parties. What are they doing? What is their structure? How do they operate? How can I serve on my party, right? Civic associations, 
know the issues in the community before you run out here saying you want to be an elected official. What you going to do? You don't even know what the issues are, right? Um, and yeah, attend council meetings. Just attend, just go. Figure out who do you really like and how can you help that person? Donate money. Money makes the world go round, y'all. It has to be a part of the game. Sure, we want campaign finance reform. Yeah, we understand it takes millions of dollars to run for office and we could be feeding a small country. However, until it's not a part of the game, if we don't contribute to this, then the folks that we really believe in will not get elected. And then the last thing is volunteer. You need to get out. You need to do something. So look up your representative, do your research, check your voter registration, you know, and talk to your family and friends about, hey, did you know, just, just share a little tidbit. Did you know that 90, 96% of the elected officials are local? You lead with a statistic, man, they'll lean in. That's all you gotta do. Oh, that's good. Two stats in effect. I keep that's that on, I dot, on deck. Two stats, y'all. You got. You just saw two stats up there. Ninety-six percent, five over five hundred thousand. That's it. That's it. So uh, this is good. Well, but can we open? Go ahead, yeah, Marla. I was going to say, I'm Natalie. Gonna... You need to. So Natalie, when Natalie said two statistics and a fact, I, whenever I'm working with a candidate, any candidate, I always tell them. I said, if you just leave with two statistics and a fact, they'll think you're brilliant. I said, just. Just find two statistics in a fact. I said, and then you just, you stay right there, you know? But the reality is it makes people want to understand, well, where did those statistics go? Well, maybe that's true. But one of the biggest things, and I told y'all, one of the biggest challenges is that we have to reframe the narrative around politics and around social work. We have to. This is good. Okay, so y'all, we've been talking for a long time. Yeah. And y'all just nodding and smiling. But questions. Do y'all have what questions do you have? If you have. Oh, I see Sarah came fast. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> um, so my I have two questions actually. My first question is you mentioned um LCSW. Uh, my field work right now is at the Department of Human Services, New Jersey, and the majority of the social workers I've spoken with there have said that they never got their LCSW and that they've never found that it's needed. It's, so, well, so the LSW, I, I, let me say this. I believe that credentials matter that um, you can't make the assumption that just because of the experience that you have, that the door will be open. Um, but the credential gives you a, a better chance for more opportunities. Um, if you are not going to have the time or the ability to, to, to bank those clinical hours, because typically macro social workers are not in that kind of clinical setting, so they're not granted the opportunity to, to meet the criteria to sit for the LCSW. Um, and that's problematic. Um, so you have to think about the trajectory of your life, where, where you would like to ultimately land and if it's beneficial to you. I believe everyone graduating from this program should um, go and sit for the licensure exam just because the information is fresh in your head, sit down, you'll, you know, get it and be done with it. Yes, it's biased. Yes, we're fighting to fix it. Yes, I'm on the task force for a moratorium because I know for a fact that it does not measure competence. However, <laughs> just like term limits for candidates, just like campaign finance reform, the reality is it is a credential that does create opportunities, especially for those who don't know who we are and what we do. So the more letters you have behind your name regarding social work, the more likely it is that you'll have uh, greater opportunities on the Hill. It's not, it's not needed, 
but it doesn't hurt. So that's my thought about LSW. LCSW is more complicated because that's a matter of, of, of uh, being able to practice in a clinical setting and, and getting those hours and, 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 and not only the hours, but developing those skills, right? So, but they are helpful in the political space. And so, I'll, I'll just jump in for that too, Sarah, because for the state of New Jersey, in the most state positions, you're not required to have any licensure, right? So that's probably like you'll hear from a lot of people who've been working for the state for a number of years. I'll be honest, and just in, in my time, I worked for the state for 15 years before I came over to Rutgers, and every job I had, it wasn't required. Right. So for me, I was like, well, I don't really need it. But then right. I started thinking like, if I want to change my career into some other stuff, then I want some more letters behind my name. And so I did, um, I had my LSW, I work for the state, but I did go back and get my LCSW um, just recently. So if yes. you want to change, you know, and do something different, then I would encourage you to do the LCSW as well. But LSW, I think everybody should, the same as my, everybody should do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and know this, when you when you go on these, these macro political uh, job hunting sites, none of them are going to ask for any of these credentials. Our credentials are not even, they'll say, we, we are, it'll say like a uh, major in political science, sociology, and other related fields. We're, we are the other related fields, right? And it is your job to convince them that your degree and what we have trained you to do is going to be beneficial in that space. When I applied for the job that I ultimately got uh, in, in Joe Biden's office, I was up against three other candidates that had law degrees. They, everybody who ever held that position had a law degree. And I was like, good, because then they can't do what I do. <laughs> they don't have community context. They don't understand what it's like to really work across the aisle and build coalitions. They're not trained in systems theory. They don't have a mindset when it comes to belief bonding and, and motivational interviewing. They, they have no clue. So I just leaned on everything that was social work that met the criteria, actually exceeded the criteria for the position. And that made them not qualified. That's what you do. So, you know, like they say, soar with your strengths. I don't think that the credential will stop you in political spaces. They're looking for advanced education, but people have everything from art history to all kinds of degrees. It's about the opportunity though. It's about getting in. When it comes to being employed in these spaces, it is building the relationships once you get in. Every job I've ever had in politics, I've come in low but I've come in low in the place where I wanted to be. I left a job making 100,000 to work at the White House for 50,000 because it was the White House. <laughs> and I knew that three months in the White House on my resume is far better than three years at a nonprofit. So, you know, it's about getting in. Uh, Ariel. Wait, Sarah, did because Sarah had two questions. I just yeah, want to make did. sure we didn't skip her, oh, her second yeah. question. <laughs> Thank you. My um, my second question was earlier when you were talking about the electoral college. Yes. And you said until that changes. Well, so I mean, it, it's I'm, up to the voters, up to the voters. Right. I, I what I'm trying to learn mm -hmm. is patience. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of the work that I'm interested in Mm -hmm. is not immediately satisfactory. So these things take a long time to see change. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how do you do that professionally? You as a person, like how yeah. do you maintain motivation if you don't necessarily see change happening right. quickly? Yes. Yeah. First of all, there's a quote, Dr. King, and he talks about the, 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 is that the moral arc is long, but it bends towards justice. It's long. Understanding that a lot of the things that I do, um, I will never see the success of that work. But I'm contributing to the change, knowing that this is a, this is a long game. 
It takes time for change to happen. But I understand that I can only do what I can do. So let me do that part. Um, and this is also part of, of cultural humility. It's not about Marla's victories, right? So why do I have to see it in my time? Why does it, but, but what does have to happen is that I need to see the short-term goals, that I am moving the ball down the field. And that for me is enough that I've contributed, you know? So, so when, I, when I look at Tennessee, and you know what is happening in that state legislature, and and it infuriates me that that you know certain practices are happening where they're trying to silence um, individuals in the community. Instead of just screaming at the television, I go to my state legislature, and I make sure that certain representatives are standing for our values, that I'm there to support them, that I'm connecting individuals in the community. Uh, to those representatives so that dollars are flowing into communities that need it, right? So when I get frustrated, I challenge, uh, channel all of that frustration into action. I'm like, okay, I'm really starting to lose it here. Let me help to get somebody elected. I got I to gotta contribute in some kind of way. So that's what I do. But, but, I, but I, I remain humble, realizing that I am not the change maker. I'm just a part of the change. Yeah. But I serve on, a, I volunteer a lot on a lot of things. I serve on boards. I, you know, I, I, I give in ways that only I can give because of my, because of my station in life, because of the privileges that I have, because of the knowledge that I have, the credentials that I have, the family that I come from. So I leverage that. I'm consciously practicing cultural humility. Um, and, and Dr. Bembry will speak about, she, she is a specialist in that area, but I'm, I am self-aware. I, I, um, and, and because of that awareness, I am intentional in doing something every day to make the world a better place, every day. Even if it's talking to a student, Send him five dollars to a candidate, and I only got six. You know, every day. Thank you, Sarah. I saw Ariel's hand up too. Hi. Uh, yeah. So my name is Ariel. I'm an OMSW in New York State. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with uh, for an agency who provides supports for people with. Uh, neurocognitive neurodevelopmental disorders so mm -hmm. we realized a lot of like a pressing concern that we had was prior to the big elections and mm -hmm. you know all of that was education and mm -hmm. like accessibility to education and education for folks uh, like available education for folks with different levels of comprehension mm -hmm. um so I was just wondering like any advisement in terms of or like any resources regarding that um especially when it comes to like I guess like more local elections because it's like such a variety of people and um in, like throughout the city throughout the state you know just to make that more acceptable for people so is there a consortium or some kind of uh coalition of organizations that that um that you are aware of there is one um i believe it was called like the new york voter uh, division was like New York Voter Disability Co um, Division or something, something of that sort. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. they because of like the pandemic, it wasn't. It's not as you know. Uh, they lost funding. They lost staffing. Um, so it's not as available now. And mm -hmm. that was like in March of 2020. Um, so a lot of it. Uh, but that's kind of like more for the entire state. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there was like anything like more local. How to how to get that um, kind of interaction going more locally. Yeah, so I would I would go national to local, um, and I I say national. I'm I'm thinking right now about the Democratic Party and how they there is a disability caucus um, that is is a part of the national organization, the national like the Democratic National Committee. They have a, a disability caucus, um, and because of the national disability caucus, 
the statewide um, parties have a disability caucus representative and they're supposed to have local um, caucuses in each state. They should, depending on the party, that is one place when it comes to um, registering and helping people become civically engaged and, 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 um, and participate, that is the responsibility of the party, right? One of the responsibilities. I don't, I, 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 I'm sharing a bunch of stuff in the links um, over here in the chat, but I, I'm a strong believer in relying on systems that already exist that um, that we are we underutilize. And so what I would say to you is I would find the, the, the legislative champion on the state level that is the champion for um, persons with disabilities. I would look for that person. When I say do the research, know the member, you look for those champions, right? And then you reach out and you say, I, you know, I'm reaching out on behalf of this. This is my issue. This is my concern. This is my need. Um, and I would love to speak to someone on your staff to figure out how to address this because you want to use somebody with power, but somebody also that has uh, the institutional knowledge about the issue that you're, you want to focus on. So find that representative in the state house and then go from there. There is a champion for that issue. I don't know New, New York politics, but I know there is. So I would find the champion, but I would also lean on the party to find out what is the disability caucus doing in, in the state? And can they you know, identify ways for the coalition um, to be reimagined? I hope that was helpful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Guys, it's 133. I can hang out all day talking politics. No problem <laughs> at all. <laughs> But if you're quiet, we also don't believe in holding y'all hostage. No, we so, don't. <laughs> and I what put, we'll do. Natalie, I put it in the chat. Yes, um, I was dropping your links too. So I oh, did okay. get your voting and social work. I got the campaign school for social workers. And then you and I both dropped the same one, the um, employment oh, bulletin yep, you and the it. gain power. Yes. And then I just put in the, the state um, elections piece. Yes. So yes. we did have those in there. And then you also put Poly Engine in. So we have those links in the chat. If you um, if you have questions, mm -hmm. feel free to reach out. Don't feel like I, I you know I saw this person on a Zoom and I don't know who they are. Feel free to reach out. We can always um, <laughs> <laughs> and you because you get emails from me anyway. You you received all the, yep. the emails for joining anyway. It came from me, but I will send these links also in an email too. That way y'all can have them, and then you could you know start if this is something you're interested in. Just kind of start getting a look at it and see like oh, maybe i want to tap into some of these things but, but um now, um dr ben go ahead, go ahead. yeah she has my information and yeah. and all kidding aside um dr Bembry knows i have students lined up out my door i cannot say no to a student i cannot say no to anyone that wants to be involved in in in, in politics in any way because that means you want to you care and i i am 100 for it you can email me I will help you, Ariel. This is not the end of the conversation. Now, now that you planted that seed, I'm going to start looking tonight to find ways that I can support you with that. But just know that you know we need you out here. We need social workers and uh, you know in political spaces that aren't afraid um, and are are, are needed. Um, our values they do align with what uh, public service is all about. No, they don't align with the way that politics is seen today, but we know that image or, or people's perception is not necessarily reality because I'm not coming to anybody's house to try to snatch their child, right? But that's people's perception of social work. So mm -hmm. let's reframe all of it and let's get involved because that's, you know, as Barbara Mikulski says, who was a Senator from Maryland, she says that uh, politics is social work with power. Right now, I don't know how powerful we are when it comes to creating change if we are not going to where the power is. So let's get our power. 
And that's what I do. So, oh, and by the way, there are so many social workers currently holding office that I just want you to look that up from the local level all the way to the national level. And there's a possibility in California that a social worker will be the next U.S. Senator in California. Mm -hmm. And that's Barbara Lee. We already mm -hmm. have a social worker as the mayor of Los Angeles in Karen Bass. So, and there are so many people that are social worker adjacent is what I call it. That means they have a social worker that's in their life that influences them. And that helps us in getting into that space. Hakeem Jeffries, the new uh, Democratic Party chair, his mother was a social worker. Joe Biden, his daughter is a social worker. So they understand who we are and what we can do. But there are a lot of people out here that are in office that have this social work degree or they have someone in their home that has a degree. So there you have it. Well, we sure appreciate y'all joining us for this time and then also hanging out with us because I know we went seven minutes over, but we do appreciate y'all joining us. You will be able to access this recording, like I mentioned earlier, and probably back to like next week or so, you'll be able to access this recording um, and 